Thank you, I'm Brian Rose. I'm a drug and alcohol counselor. I work with Alliance Wellness. Um, they asked me to speak tonight and they didn't really tell me what I should talk about. So I've been thinking for a couple days like what I'm gonna talk about. And one of the biggest questions I think in the room is how do you know if you need help, right? And for, you know, for the mothers in the room, how do you know that your son or daughter needs help? For the young people in the room, how do you know if you need help? And that, that question is the first step getting you in. I mean, the clients that I work with, a lot of them come in because they've gotten legal entanglements, right? Do you wanna see that your son or do you wanna see yourself go to treatment because you got arrested? Right? Are you, is your only avenue to treatment staying out of jail? You can do it before then. There's other ways. So the first thing I'll talk about is what's it actually look like when you hit the point of addiction, when you're no longer just having fun with your friends, but you find yourself in real trouble. Am I too far away? Sorry about that. Can you hear me better now? <clears throat> so one of the things about addiction you will you know have people in your life that are battling addiction and you'll say you're addicted and their first answer will be no i'm not right we've i'm, I'm guessing a lot of people in this room have had that battle with somebody you have a problem no i don't you're out all night so what all my friends are out all night you don't have a job, you dropped out of school. I mean, we can name all the reasons in the world that show that this is a problem in the community and we can see it in each other pretty easily. But no matter what, no matter how apparent that is, when you confront somebody that has a problem with addiction, their first answer is gonna be, no, that's not me. I don't have that problem. So if you, if you are using illicit drugs, the first reaction is, this is what my friends do. This is what everybody around me is doing. They don't have a problem, how can I have a problem? How can you see addiction in yourself? You know, professionally, I have this list of questions that I go through with every client, and that's how I decide, should they go to treatment or not? It's not just that somebody's using drugs and I need to bring them to treatment, it's what's going on in their life that's showing that this is disordered use or that this is a problem. For those of you that are using drugs, if you get to a point where you say like, you know, I'm gonna go out with my friends and I might, you know, have a couple bars or I might have Fetty. If you say to yourself, I'm gonna take a bar and you wake up in the morning and your pocket's empty and you don't remember what happened, that's a sure sign that something's not right. That's a problem. If you, are at home and your son comes home and he walks in the door and you have an argument and he's not speaking clearly and the next morning you bring it up and he acts like nothing happened, that's a sign that he might not remember what happened. He probably came home in a condition that we call blackout. That's important to know. These things are really important to notice. They don't just go away and they signal a much bigger problem. Um, you know, particularly when we're talking about drugs like fentanyl and Percocet and Xanax, these are drugs that were never meant to be used for fun. Granted, they show up as pretty fun in, in the world that we live in right now. But in the long term, nobody gets out alive. You don't know a whole lot of old fentanyl users. You never meet a very old Xanax user. The risk of overdose and the risk of death, I mean, death is only half a breath away, right? Why would you wanna speed along that process? So if you're looking around and you're noticing people in your community are dying and you're like, oh, I live that way, how do, you, how do you respond to yourself? If you look around and you see somebody's son has died of an overdose and you see that behavior in your own son, what do you do next? And I mean, the best advice I could give is you can't do this on your own, right? Addiction has been a problem throughout the world for a long time. And one thing people have learned is this is not something you can deal with on your own. Why would you want to? If there are people out there that are offering help, why would you take this on yourself? 
This is a really hard part. I've worked with the Somali community for about a year and a half now. And when I started, I had three clients that were under the age of 25. And now almost all my clients are under the age of 25. All my young clients then were doing Xanax. Now all my young clients are doing Percocet and fentanyl. This is changing. What this was last year is different this year. If you think it's the same problem, you're not paying attention because it's getting worse. I've got more clients now than I know what to do with. And there's more waiting. And I'm learning more and more names every day. Right? I tend to learn my clients' names before I ever meet them in person because I hear about the community. I hear about your sons. I hear about your daughters. I know who they are long before they've ever met me. So when it comes time to help them find help, you've got to go to people that can help you, right? And there are people that have some experience and there's people that can give you spiritual guidance, there's people that can give you community guidance, but there's a really good chance that you need professional help. One of the most important reasons to get help early is like I said when I started, the number one way that people find treatment right now is through the criminal justice system. And one of the hardest things that I see with my clients when it comes time for them to actually live their life sober, there's a sense of hopeless that's pervasive because now they have felonies and they don't know where to turn. You can get out of addiction before you get involved in criminal justice. That's an important aspect of it. For a lot of you, if you, can, if you can find help, if you can reason with whoever you, you know is dealing with addiction in their life, the next step is what do you do? Do you go for treatment? And every client that finds treatment, every person that deals with addiction that finds treatment goes through a similar process. And the first step in that process is assessment. So if you have somebody in your life that, you, that is dealing with addiction, one of the first things you need to do is find a way for them to get assessed. Very often people will get assessed in jail and detox. And that's been the way things have been going for now. But you can get involved in that process earlier. There's a lot of treatment centers in Minneapolis. I might do them on time. Oh, had to check the time. I will talk forever, so you guys let me know. Um, so imagine that you're in a situation where in a moment of clarity you actually make some progress with somebody in your life that's dealing with addiction and they say something that they might be considering the fact that they might have a problem. That's probably the best you're going to get. At that point you need to act. The first step in that action is getting an assessment. Um, you can go through treatment centers, you can go through detox. I'm going to talk about detox a little bit. Huh. <laughs> so, one aspect of this is and Khalid, Khalid, Khalid hit on this earlier, and that is withdrawal. Um, one of the biggest things that clues people into that they're dealing with addiction and one of the things that shows us that somebody's dealing with addiction is withdrawal. Withdrawal is the body's physical dependence on a chemical. So whether we're talking about Fetty or Percocet or Xanax, when you physically don't feel good without it, that's withdrawal. That's the start of it. That sickness is a big motivation for people using. One of the hard parts and one of the big don'ts about this is if somebody's been using drugs long enough to be physically dependent, you can't just have them quit on their own. The motivation isn't there, the sickness is going to be bad, and in some cases with drugs like Xanax, the withdrawal can kill you. At that point, that's when we seek out things like detox. And detox can be a real blessing because it's where assessments are done and it's often how people get into treatment. So if you're dealing with somebody that's wrestling with addiction and they're physically dependent, and you'll know because they'll look sick often, 
right? If you're doing fentanyl or Percocet, every seven or eight hours you're starting to get sick. That's how often you have to reuse to fight the withdrawal. If you notice that sickness, if all of a sudden you're thinking, wow, my son is sick every seven or eight hours, and the sickness can look like the flu, then it might be time to take it to the next level and suggest something like detox. But that physical dependence is definitely the first sign of a real dangerous situation. It's also the first sign of somebody not being able to quit on their own. When somebody's physically dependent on a chemical, quitting really isn't the option. Because the moment you quit, it's the moment you get sick. So you're constantly motivated to start using again based on the sickness that you feel. That can be your gateway into getting somebody help. It can also be the gateway into getting somebody to realize that they have more of a problem. Because if you're doing something that's making you sick every seven, eight hours, it might not be as fun as you're telling yourself it is. If you're doing something that you wake up and you lost a whole day, or you're doing the same thing that a friend did that died, it's the first sign to tell you that somebody's having a problem. And that is when you act. That's the biggest do of everything we're talking about. When somebody is vulnerable at the moment of sickness for physical dependence, that's when our best chance for getting them help is. We just have to notice the signs and realize that if we're dealing with somebody that's 19 or 20 years old, there's no reason to expect that they're going to be sick with the flu all the time. If we can't wake our child up, there's no reason that somebody under the age of 100 can't be woken up. That's a sign of a problem. These are all things that we need to look out for because these are the moments when we can first help somebody. It's also the first chance you might have to convince somebody that they have a problem when they've been denying it to you all along. What am I doing all the time? Good. So again, just to recap everything, like keep an eye out on people's behavior. Young people don't generally get sick that often. And sickness is one of the first signs of addiction that we can see. Um, it's not just our sons, it's our daughters too. That sickness is also, like I said, a blessing. It's maybe the first chance you have to have a reasonable conversation to tell somebody that they have a problem. When you seek out an assessment or detox or anything like that, another thing that's really important is to let somebody know nobody is forced into treatment. In the state of Minnesota, there's no way to force somebody to go to treatment. So you can always say, hey, try this. Go and experience it. Once you have legals behind it, then you might be forced to stay in treatment or face your legal consequences. But if somebody goes to seek help early before they run into trouble like that, they never get, nobody ever gets to say, you have to stay here. You can walk in, you can answer the questions, and then you can walk out. You're free to go. Pay attention to the questions people are asking you because they might give you the answer that you've been looking for for a while. But that's really, I mean, those are the things to pay attention to. So I'm going to wrap up. That's all I have to say. If anybody has any questions for me afterwards, seek me out, and uh, I can give you pointers on what to do next. <laughs>